We are going to discuss today um, a very broad subject, including image rights, rights of publicity, life stories. Um, I want to say that to begin with, and maybe we put the next slide, um, okay. Uh, during COVID-19, uh, we have enjoyed in our leisure time, uh, a lot of television programs um, dealt with uh, streaming services and we were fascinated um, by films um, showing the life of famous people, not so famous, some of them, athletes, celebrities, and uh, people of certain reputation. Um, so obviously the access to Netflix, um, Amazon Prime, Hulu, uh, ESPN uh, was very important to us. Um, we have to, um, first of all, um, our firm is very involved in dealing with athletes. And um, even though we do primarily intellectual property, the areas of protection of image rights and rights of publicity became very important in our practice, especially dealing with endorsement, promotion, and sponsorship agreements. Um, I would say that, you know, I was particularly affected like everybody else with the news about the accident of Tiger Woods. And first thing I would like as part of our um, presentation, wish him a lot of success and a speedy recovery. He's an excellent golfer, but more than anything else, a great human being. Now, when dealing with celebrities and sports figures, um, we have to start by the premise that famous people cannot necessarily control the way they are portrayed or the description made of these figures. Uh, the Ninth Circuit, in a famous case that I will deal with later on, Olivia de Havilland versus Feud, um, well, um, versus the, um, I would say, the producers of Feud, indicated that famous um, people could defend themselves against defamation, but they are not the owners of history. And writers, writers, filmmakers, producers are creators, and they are protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution that protects uh, free expression and free speech. And obviously, they make a lot of money um, um, creating these incredible series, films, books, etc. Next slide. Now, um, right now, uh, we see a whole different concept in terms of celebrities. A celebrity due to social media could become famous, a, an individual could become famous just because they decided to create a video in YouTube. Uh, recently, I noticed an individual for instance, a, a lady that decided to use monkey glue for a new hairdo. Now, this monkey glue could not be removed from her hair, but in a weird way, she became a famous, successful individual that created a different way to deal with her hair. She ended up in the hands of a, of, of, of a plastic surgeon that basically helped her to remove uh, this glue. So that is an extreme. But now we see a lot of celebrities, we see a lot of bloggers and fashionistas, which basically support and endorse uh, the famous trademarks and not so famous just to become famous of um, trademarks, brand services of parties. Now, the FTC has been involved in controlling the way these 
uh, relationship is now presented. And whenever they have an agreement with a brand owner to endorse certain products, that has to be disclosed to the public. This is not a situation we are, they are endorsing on their own certain products. This is a situation where they have breached agreements sometimes for substantial amount of money to endorse these products. Next. Now, um, today um, we are dealing with media and entertainment to a certain degree. Uh, entertainment obviously is a very broad subject, legal subject. Our discussion will be focused on the right of publicity, First Amendment of the Constitution, Lanamac, the doctrine of, in, of incentive, um, fair use, copyright, transform, transformative use, and parody, docudramas, and biopics. Um, a very challenging list of legal concepts, but I will touch on them in terms of um, the celebrities and um, uh, public figures in athletes. Okay. Now, um, historically, the publicity right was derived from the common law statutory right of privacy, which has been recognized in most of the state. Um, right of uh, privacy is basically defined as a warrant and brand deed as the right to be left alone. Now, William Prosser enunciated four categories of um, uh, uh, you know, personal right to privacy. The first one is protection against intrusion into one's private affairs. The second is the avoidance of disclosure of one's embarrassing private facts. The third, protection against publicity and public, you know, placing one in a false light in the public eye and remedies, that's the four, for appropriation, usually for commercial advantage of, of one, one's name and likeness. Uh, the fourth one falls within the rights of pu publicity. The, the idea of the right of publicity is to protect the person's economic interest in their likeness and, and becomes um, likeness or economic value of their persona. And it's, it's the ability by the individual to commercially exploit their name, picture, likeness, and in some cases, gestures or attributes. Now the New York right of publicity uh, of privacy basically was codified in the New York civil right law sections 50 and 51 and provides criminal and civil remedies for unauthorized use of a person name precisely for advertising or purpose of trade. Now, in the case of celebrities, um, you know, it's very difficult for them in a way they have waived the right of privacy because of their own actions and their own life. Um, we have to also consider that this, uh, the right of uh, publicity uh, is incorporated in state statutes and if there is no federal law uh, governing the right of publicity. That's why in many cases, um, um, individuals would use the Lanham Act as a way to support a federal claim. Now, what is re required in terms of the right of publicity? One is fame, is required that, but that's not only, um, that's not enough. Um, fame is important, but any party whose rights were violated must show that they were committed to 
in a way uh, commercialize or explode the commercial aspects of their images. And commercialize doesn't mean selling products. It's just, it could be an endorsement. It could be a sponsorship. They have to make an effort to show that uh, they had an interest in, in commercialize their image. Uh, many states have adopted also um, um, different aspects of the persona. In some, as I say, they include um, just the name, the likeness, um, and, and um, different attributes. In other states, they include nicknames, voice, gestures, signatures. And um, many states have adopted the postmortem rights. And in New York, uh, Governor Cuomo signed a new law by which um, the um, basically the protection for publicity and privacy rights were expanded. And now in New York, it's possible to protect postmortem rights as of uh, March uh, 30, 2000, 2021 in connection with deceased people. This law is not retroactive. So it's up on death on March or thereafter that the heirs and the states are able to um, sue people in the event of breaches to the right of publicity and take advantage of the commercial exploitation of um, the names, likeness, et cetera. Continue, yes. The early decisions, I would say one um, that was fascinated is Thomas Edison that created a formula against pain and Polyform decided to utilize Edison Polyform as part of the label and Edison, very clever person, <laughs> decided this is not correct and um, went to court to stop Polyform from using the name Edison. But the most important early decision was Helen versus Top Chewing Gum. This is a case where Helen Labs uh, signed an agreement with a ball player. The agreement uh, created um, um, certain limitations for the ball player to give the rights to his photographs to third parties uh, in connection with chewing gum because of that agreement signed with Helen. Uh, Tops Chewing Gum, a competitor of Helen, decided to use the right of privacy as the basis for arguing that whatever the ball player has been given to Helen was just a release. And the court in this particular case says something very important, which most of the courts and the authority credit this case with promoting the concept of modern right of publicity. It says, in addition to the right of privacy, a man has a right in the publicity value of his photograph. The right must be called a right of publicity. Many prominent persons may feel deprived if they do not longer receive money for authorizing advertisements that could be the subject of exclusive grant. So this decision is very crucial in terms of the post um, uh, decisions about the right of publicity. Now, interesting enough, more recent decision, although not that recent, is um, involved Tiger Woods. And um, this was decided in Ohio, ETW um, is the arm, the licensing arm of Tiger Woods, um, basically has all the IP rights. And um, they find out that uh, Rick Rush, uh, a famous sports artist, um, designed a, a poster. And the poster included the figure of Tiger Woods, his caddies, 
the background of the Augusta um, Clubhouse, and it was to commemorate um, precisely the uh, win, exceptional win by Tiger Woods um, in Augusta, where he was the youngest golfer that was able to obtain this trophy. And uh, so ETW decided that this was an infringement, um, not only to the right of publicity, but also uh, to the trademark rights, because um, Tiger Woods had a good collection of trademark rights, including in class 16 for posters and other printed material. In this particular uh, case, the court decided that the use of Tiger Woods when shipping the poster to customer was just a title to identify the product and that it was enough transformative elements in the poster to be protected under um, the First Amendment and therefore uh, Rick Rush was able to continue selling this poster. Contrary to that, we see a case of Vanna White in California where Samsung came up with a Roebuck um, for one of the advertisements. Uh, Vanna White was known for the, as a person that was turning letters in the wheel of um, fortune. And uh, she claimed that uh, her right of publicity was violated by the representation by Samsung of, or by the creation of a robot that had similar dress and appearance and, um, and uh, you know, here as Vanna White and she won the case and obtained substantial damages. Okay, uh, the right of publicity also requires the damage to reputation, uh, which enables a person to commercialize his persona. Uh, Nor uh, Manuel Noriega sued a company, a video a game company, that claimed um, the inclusion of his character Mm -hmm. and he claimed to um, be able to obtain damages. I mean, damages in money, but also to stop the video because it was damaging his reputation. Manuel Noriega was serving time for drug dealing and laundering money. So um, it's questionable as to how much the reputation was uh, damage. In addition, he was only one of 40 different characters and not the relevant one. Um, another factor to be taken into consideration in, in evaluating the right of publicity is intent. We have the case of Michael Jordan versus Dominic Supermarket. And it was a, congrat a congratulatory advertisement when um, Michael Jordan um, was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, but included a $2 okay. off coupon for stakes. Uh, Jordan indicated this is not a good ad. I decide which are the endorsements I want to have and this, in this particular in instance, the two of coupon dollars for stake uh, was a clear indication that the ad was used for commercial purposes. Um, um, Michael Jordan, although obviously he didn't need that, got the $10 million uh, as a verdict. Karim Abdul Shabar, somebody that we know well, uh, basically started two actions, one against um, General Motors, uh, who used Luan Alcindor in advertising, and he won the case. Why? Because Karim adopted the name Karim Abdul Shabar for religious purposes, but his name was Luan Alcindor. 
So obviously it's, it was a nice way by um, General Motors to circumvent the use of his name by using an old name. But it still was the, the, the name Lou Alcindor appeared in documents and uh, birth certificates and basically was very much part of his persona. Another case we intimately know was Karim Abdul Shabar that started an action against football player Karim, K A R I M, who um, basically changed his name because he was created some degree of confusion. Okay, now our concern, basically, as I say at the beginning, was. Um, the um, protection of the images of athletes, the names, the other attributes. Why? Essentially because there are several factors that we have discussed with the agents. One is the length of their career, although if we follow what happened with Tom Brady, um, the length of his career has been quite substantial when winning at the last Super Bowl. And, uh, but in any event, um, the athletes are always concerned about the intrusion in their private life. And they um, take very seriously um, the protection of their image attributes against unauthorized commercial exploitation. Now, um, and they are very concerned about preventing unjust enrichment and harm to their images. Throughout the years, one thing evolved and is important is the protection of the athletes' names and also celebrities as trademarks and service marks. Uh, this is important because we see it in many athletes such as Arthur Ashe, um, obviously passed away many, many years ago, but had a foundation. The protection of the name as um, of the athlete, even um, as in, for services as a way to endorse other people's products, lasts forever as long as it's properly used. Uh, the right of publicity has to be exercised and uh, by the individual. And even though most of the states have post-mortem rights, the reality is a good trademark registration is very helpful in protecting the sports figures. And it's a good trademark um, uh, you know, program. And we see that with their Jordan and many other athletes. Uh, in this case, um, you know, Pelé, Sue, Samsung Electronics, um, basically he um, negotiated originally an agreement, was never um, signed, but at the same time, Samsung copied the famous scissor kicks in one advertisement and uh, Pelé sued them. I mean, obviously this was an appropriation of a very distinguished um, gesture and movement on the part of Pele. Next. Okay, um, the First Amendment. Uh, the First Amendment in terms of um, the right of publicity is very important in order to analyze um, the protection of the public interest. Um, the, it should be balanced against in, in terms of an analysis of infringement and including copyright infringement. It gives rights um, to individuals to express their opinion and to express um, in many cases their comments that um, are crucial as information. So, uh, but it's always a balance that we have to consider between the protection of the public interest and the access to information and the rights of publicity or privacy. And uh, essentially in cases where 
the information becomes um, newsworthy. And this is when the, the individuals need to know and need to be appraised of um, uh, different things happening to the celebrities and public figures. Um, you know, one interesting thing uh, that I noticed yesterday, precisely with Tiger Woods, is the amount of information people expected in terms of the prognosis after the accident. Under normal circumstances, um, an accident could be revealed. But in this particular case, the accident went beyond. The accident affected a very important celebrity and public figure. And people have, in a way, the right to know when their life become part of our own life. And the First Amendment in that regard is very important to protect free speech. Um, the video game has been protected um, by the First Amendment as a form of entertainment, but there is a whole uh, controversy right now as to NCAA uh, players that are not properly remunerated by a company such as Electronic Game for the use of their images, uh, characters, and avatars. Okay, these are quick, interesting cases. Um, Federico Fellini created a program involving Fred and Ginger. Uh, the years sued Federico Fellini at the time. The decision was made that uh, by the court that the title was appropriate uh, for the content, content of the video. Uh, in the case of Comedy 3 Productions uh, involving Three Stooges, um, the drawings created by an artist um, were um, stop circulation because basically they this drawing by this artist created the identical image of the Stooges. And the Lanham Act. Why is so important the Lanham Act? Um, there are um, the Lanham Act in Section 43 basically is, is the federal trademark law and provides a claim if a party creates a likelihood of confusion or unfalse association or endorsement of a person with a brand. And this is important because most of the cases we see involving right of publicity would have that um, claim of likelihood of confusion or association. Uh, we see this, for instance, in the case of Woody Allen, where he was able to stop um, a company from a video club company from using lookalikes in great part on the basis of uh, the right of publicity, in great part on the basis of trademark law under 43A. Now, this, um, in addition, the trademark law provides that um, uh, the name of the living individual, if wants to register a trademark, requires the signature of uh, this individual. And uh, it's not possible to obtain an, uh, uh, to file an application on a living individual without his or her signature consenting to the application. And the same thing happened with the anti cyber scoring Consumer Protection Act, where um, the name of an individual, uh, especially a celebrity, an athlete, cannot be included, otherwise would be the subject of an action under um, the anti cyber squaring um, Consumer Protection Act. Now, the doctrine of incentive, I included here um, because I thought it was very peculiar as a Supreme Court decision. Um, this is where Mr. Sacchini performed a stunt, and this goes back to 1977, of a human cannonball, where he was shot from a cannon into um, 
a net 200 feet away in a country fair. Now, um, a broadcasting company film and air in their news the entire act. And uh, this case, uh, you know, went to the Supreme Court and the court clearly indicated um, the, that the right of publicity in this case um, was analogous to a certain this so to a certain extent to the goals of patents and copyright laws and protected the proprietary interest of the individual in the act. If the whole performance was televised, then uh, people would not go to the fairs to see this guy performing such a difficult act. And so, um, you know, obviously the, the court ruled in, in uh, Sakini's favor. Okay, this is uh, rather interesting and is very broad. And, um, you know, normally we say that um, the right of publicity has more similarities with trademarks than with copyrights because copyrights are rights in original works of authorship, fixing a tangible medium of expression. Um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking that if somebody has a photograph that wants to use for advertisement, more than likely would require the consent depending on the circumstances, but more likely would require the consent of the photographer or the copyright and the celebrity for the rights of publicity. Uh, there are some exceptions to this rule, um, but uh, in terms of fair use, this is a doctrine over 150 years old and it was incorporated in the copyright law. Um, essentially, is is such a broad and complex uh, situation that, um, in order to decide whether a case um, could apply the fair use concept, more than likely will end up in federal court. Now, um, judges use four factors in fair use disputes. The factors are the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the portion taken and the effect of the use upon the potential market. Basically what was incorporated in the law is that the use of a part of a copyrighted material is totally acceptable in cases of research, if it's newsworthy, um, in cases of transformation, and also in case of parody, which you know is putting a ridiculous um, and comic aspect to the copyrighted material. And this is why I presented this case. This is Demi Moore um, in when she was pregnant, seven months pregnant, and Labor Witch um, created this photograph, which ended up with Vanity Fair. And then um, we have this um, naked gun <laughs> actor <laughs> that uh, was involved in an advertising campaign promoting the movie. And in this particular case, the court um, specifically point out to a number of differences in the light, the, the body, the exposure, the ring, etc. But the reality, um, nobody could get confused uh, with these pictures and certainly was uh, considered to be horribly. Now I put Bernie Sanders photograph because he has fascinated the world in terms of, um, uh, you know, at the time of the inauguration of Biden. And it was taken by the photographer, which my understanding licensed the picture now to Getty. So um, there may be 
other reasons um, for doing that. Um, we understand that some products were, um, in, were produced, including this picture, but the proceeds were sent to charity. Um, I haven't seen any warning letters or cases in terms of the improper use of this image, but we'll see what happens in the future. Okay, now we are talking about life stories. We talk about the First Amendment that is always present con when considered an action for infringement to the right of publicity, invasion of privacy, copyrights. And basically the free dissemination of information, newsworthiness and free speech. There is always an evaluation if the use of the celebrity's image outweighs the public interest. Um, but on the other hand, if the presentation of the celebrity um, in biographies or other forms of expression is with actual malice or reckless disregard for the truth, the celebrity's interest will outweigh the interest of the public. And this happened in a Clint Eastwood um, lawsuit where the National Enquirer prefabricated an interview with him uh, that never existed and um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, the right of publicity was claimed. Uh, the article was completely fictional, not defamatory, but the court uh, considered the use of each would name, photograph, and First Amendment and determined that all the statements were false. Now uh, we come to an interesting situation um, because it is one issue that I want to discuss uh, as well here. Uh, essentially, um, we have to go into the premise that biographies do not require approval of the celebrity if the biography of a person's life is accurate and is chronologically correct and presents truthful facts. Um, in, this case, in this case, it cannot be allowed defamation. If it's um, just a novel or fictionalized, it may not be a biography and um, could be actionable. Um, we have several cases. One case is Mary Trump and Simon and & Schuster. Uh, Mary Trump, um, and, and this is very recent, basically signed a confidentiality agreement with the Trump family not to disclose certain aspects of um, their life. Uh, she decided to write a book um, primarily on uh, Donald Trump and uh, was taken to court and to make a long story short, for a while she was not allowed to advertise the book, but at the same time, uh, the court considered that uh, Simon and Schuster uh, was not subject to any agreement or confidentiality agreement, and therefore the book was published and was promoted. Um, recently, Simon and Schuster um, got involved in uh, in a sort of situation with um, the Senator uh, Holly um, in terms of the publication of a book for his point of views and uh, challenge of the election. Simon and Schuster, who had a moral clause included in the publishing contract, decided to cancel uh, the contract with Senator Holly. Um, now, the issue here is very interesting because moral clauses, I see them in all type of contracts, they are usually called the bad clauses, but what they do is uh, create the means for a party to cancel uh, an agreement. And this I see also in the sponsorships and the endorsement agreements with athletes where um, the uh, contracting party or the brand owner normally would have and reserve the rights 
to cancel the agreement if there are issues that are that could harm the reputation of the brand. And, and it has happened in many instances due to the behavior or of either the celebrities, uh, the individuals, or um, the athletes. Um, I will go into Howard Hughes' biography, which, which was the subject of a lawsuit uh, because he was trying to prevent um, you know, a party, a, another publisher from uh, uh, publish, from, uh, from the publication of a book. And basically um, what the court decided is that a public figure has not exclusive right to his own life story and others need no consent of permission to write about the individual as a biography or, or um, of a celebrity. We need to continue. Next. Okay, um, the Queen's Gambit, I just put it there for two reasons. One, because I enjoy it very much and uh, I like chess. And uh, second, because it was considered for uh, many people consider that she existed and no, she didn't. She was uh, basically an individual that came from a book that was written like 37 years ago. And this is typical in the reenactment of actual events and also in the stories of uh, different individuals. Sometimes it becomes so real that we believe the person existed. Um, in the case of life stories, uh, they can be actionable and the publicity loss and defamation if the combination of the events, as I said before, were not properly presented and resulting in confusion among the publics. Uh, very quickly, um, in the early 1980s, um, uh, there was this idea of creating a docudrama about the life of Elizabeth Taylor, and she called a press conference to announce that ABC stories of my life is completely fictionalized unless there was somebody under the carpet or under my bed for 50 years. And she claimed that um, it was not a biography, nor a documentary. This project never proceeded. Um, if the life of a celebrity is presented in an authorized account, there could be injuries, embarrassment, and loss of income. Let's continue. Uh, this is the Olivia de Havilland case where I will make it very simple. Um, Olivia de Havilland um, had a very small participation in the miniseries feud through uh, um, Catherine uh, uh, Zeta-Jones. Uh, it was only 70 minutes of 392. Uh, she claimed that there were four causes of actions, the common law privacy tort of misappropriation, violation of civil code section, 3344 California statutory right of publicity, false, false light invasion of privacy and just enrichment. The Ninth Circuit uh, had a, a difficult position deciding this case, but fortunately for producers, directors and creators, um, it was properly decided and the right of publicity cannot consist with the First Amendment be a right to control the celebrity's image by censoring disagreeable portrait, portrayals. And in this case, the First Amendment prevailed. Everybody was anxious about this decision, but for several reasons, this case was uh, properly decided. Now, obviously, um, and I'm going quickly through this, there are many advantages in obtaining a signed contract with a celebrity to produce a docudrama, biography, or audiovisual, including all the rights to the production, distribution, etc. 
the possibility to use members of the family, the possibility to use other biographies, the possibility to use photographs and valuable documents of the individuals. But it's also important to make sure that the celebrity would not direct the information or the presentation to the public as he or she wants to be portrayed. Uh, but obviously the, a good contract could be of help. And this is um, a fascinating situation. Um, the last dance um, was basically the, the life of uh, Michael Jordan with other athletes. His company was involved in the production and distribution and his company um, basically had a lot to say regarding the presentation of him as an individual and other players. Um, there was criticism, although the, the series were very interesting and nice, but there was criticism because uh, one of the famous producers of sports events said it would have been nice to, to produce a film like this invoking the First Amendment and having the freedom to decide the content of um, the series, as opposed to the series to be, to a certain degree, manipulated uh, so that they would present these players in the light they wanted to be presented. And this is the end 